If you've ever been going past downtown Las Vegas on the Las Vegas Boulevard and have ever visited or gone near the famous Neon Museum, then you might have seen a giant rotating slipper suspended on a pylon. You might also have wondered what the deal with this structure was. It's next to another sign that you already know where it's from, given the fact that it has text displaying its source and where it's actually from, the Bow and Arrow Motel. It's also right next to the Neon Museum, meaning that it has to have some sort of historical significance. Well, it does. In fact, the slipper dates all the way back to the 1950s, coming from a casino that was once part of a small theme park. Today, we're going to talk about that casino and theme park, and how that silver slipper ended up here. In 1947, a large hotel and casino at the time, The Last Frontier, had an idea to add its own theme park adjacent to the hotel complex. Named The Last Frontier Village, it would have had a theme that revoked the old western era of Nevada. Originally made to attract customers to the hotel and casino, the small theme park would include a massive antique collection, which Robert Caudill, a million dollar gambler associated with the casino, began collecting in 1914. It would also include real trains that people would be able to enter. The Last Frontier Village would officially open sometime in 1949 with a substantial amount of themed replicas of different buildings made to resemble a stereotypical old western town, including stores, jails, and a train station. There were also stuff like vintage cars, a museum, an old carousel and circus equipment, a total of two bars, and most importantly, trains, including a 1930s mining train, a narrow gauge, and a quarter pound spike. It is unclear whether the theme park was a major success or not, but it was clear that one new thing needed to be added in order to gain that true Las Vegas feel, and for that, it needed its own casino. During the late 1940s, Belden and Kanoman, who would later go on to own the El Rancho Vegas, had decided that he wanted his own casino. He chose to have one right next to the Last Frontier Village, or more specifically, the area occupying the horse stables of the Last Frontier that were currently owned by FIDA and Tex Gates, which were also home to horses that guests would be able to ride on, similar to the ones at the El Rancho Vegas. It would originally be named the Silver Slipper. However, there was already a small bar located on Boulder Highway with the same name, and thus, it had to be renamed to the Golden Slipper Saloon and Gambling Hall. The Golden Slipper would officially open on September of 1950, made to have a distinct western theme designed by architect Martin Stern Jr. so it could fit with the rest of the theme park. Inside the casino was a total of 21 table games, a wheel of fortune machine, poker tables, and three craps tables, along with bingo. There was also the Las Vegas Strip's first convention hall, containing 11,000 square feet of space and seats that can hold up to 1,900 guests and visitors. Also included were boxing, a buffet, the speakeasy Red Garter Lounge, and its signature attraction at the time being not just the Last Frontier Village itself, but also its burlesque shows, which featured showgirls dancing throughout the night. The Golden Slipper was the first ever major casino on the Strip, being the only casino at the time to not include its own hotel. The grand opening included a fireworks show at night at the 5th, along with an open house day later on the 6th. Its main audience were small bettors, simply wanting to gamble instead of a casino that wasn't too big or noisy compared to the other Las Vegas Strip hotels. Vegas celebrities such as Frank Sinatra and the rest of the Rat Pack referred to the Silver Slipper as an inside crowd joint because of this. The name Golden Slipper would only last for a few months until December of 1950 when it was renamed to the Silver Slipper, a name that was being considered even before the casino opened. To rename this, Kinoman allegedly bought the bar with the same name back on Boulder Highway and closed it just so he could gain the rights to having the name. However, another story exists from William Moore himself, who claimed that the Golden Nugget on Fremont Street threatened to file a lawsuit against them due to the name and look being too similar to the downtown Las Vegas casino, and thus the Golden in the Golden Slipper had to be dropped. A few years later, in 1954, the Silver Slipper would receive one of the most iconic signs throughout the vintage Las Vegas timeline, a giant, literal silver slipper that was parched on top of the corner of the casino building that rotated clockwise. It was designed by Jack Larson Sr. and was originally painted blue, however, it was painted red later on. 
There was also a giant roadside sign installed by the casino that featured an animated neon slot machine. The Silver Slipper would be seeing some changes starting later in the 1950s and early 1960s, starting with the addition of the Gay 90s Lounge. Beginning of the early 1960s, the neighboring Lost Frontier Village would begin to go under, and thus, the theme park would slowly begin demolishing parts of itself. This gave the opportunity for the Super Slipper to do some remodeling, including repainting its building and signs more red. The casino was a major success in its early years, however, that would be cut short for a pretty infamous incident in vintage Las Vegas history. On April of 1964, the Silver Slipper was suspectively caught in the middle of cheating during games of house and dice. According to officials, the casino was operating what is known as a flat dice during a game of craps. For those who don't know, a flat dice is a pair of dice that have been shaved out on one side so that a combination of 6 and 1, which is a winning combination, would not show up as often as it regularly should, giving the house a substantial extra advantage. This violated Nevada's gaming regulations, and thus, the entire casino was forced to close until the case was settled, with its shows being temporarily transferred to the nearby Castaways Hotel and Casino. By the time the case had settled, Bill and Kaneman, who had owned the Silver Slipper since its opening, had already retired from the casino industry after a horrific fire from the El Rancho Vegas back in 1960, another casino that he owned. And so, Claudin Williams and Shelby Williams, who would soon go on to create the Holiday Casino, began owning the small casino, which meant that it could fully reopen one year later in 1965. As the majority of the last Frontier Village was now nothing but a parking lot at this point, the casino would go on to make its first ever expansion in 1966, extending and renovating the casino area and adding to its initial western theme. The iconic Silver Slipper sign would also be moved to its distinct roadside sign, which had also changed. Eventually, as the 1960s came to an end, the last frontier village would be demolished, and the large sign featured at the entrance would be transported to Beatty, now being used as a sign for a parking lot. Despite a fire in the casino's Kino area on December 19, 1966, the Silver Slipper would quietly go back to running on full time. On February 14, 1966, some of its burlesque shows were replaced with the introduction of Minsky's Follies, which was mainly similar to previous shows. That, along with Minsky's Burlesque Follies on March 14, 1967. On April 30, 1968, Howard Hughes, who was living in a penthouse suite at the Desert Inn at the time, had decided to buy the Silver Slipper Casino for over $5 million as part of an ongoing buyout of many other casinos that would eventually be owned by Hughes' company, the Summer Corporation. Before this, Hughes had noticed that part of the large neon slipper would sometimes stop rotating and point directly into the room. Because of this, he thought that there was some sort of camera that was only made to spy on him. Not only that, but every time he asked the casino to make the sign stop rotating, he was given a firm no. This, according to rumors, was the true reason he even bought out the silver slipper. It was later found out in 1973 that the whole purchase wasn't even a purchase, but was instead a lease bought out by Hughes and the later owners of the Frontier. This caused major legal action to take place, and thus the Silver Slipper was forced to be sold to Hughes. This would last all the way until April of 1977, when the Nevada Supreme Court ruled that the Summer Corporation could finally purchase the casino. Throughout the 1970s, the Silver Slipper would begin to see new shows, including The Wonderful World of Burlesque in 1972, and the quite unique Boylesque in 1978. Boy, what a way to make a living. Kenny, can I put my Marilyn Monroe in the show? Cool it, baby. Just stick to your bumps and grinds. Okay. All right, but Sinatra's in the audience. Oh. For just $4.95 and you don't have to buy a drink unless you want one, you can see Boylesque 78 at the Silver Slipper. By the 1980s, the Silver Slipper would sadly go under, and by the end of its timeline, the only thing the casino was known for were Broylesque and its own buffet, which was literally named The Great Buffet. On June 23, 1988, Margaret Elardi, who had also owned the Frontier at the time, bought the Silver Slipper for over $70 million from Howard Hughes and the Summer Corporation. Most people would accept this as a simply harmless buyout, but what people didn't realize was that the purchase was for the demolition of the once iconic casino. The Silver Slipper, after 40 years, would officially close forever on November 29, 1988.
Originally, the casino was meant to be replaced with an all-new luxurious hotel and casino that would keep the legacy and namesake of the Silver Slipper. But sadly, that would not happen. And sadly, the casino remained as a parking lot for the Frontier, in which it would later be imploded in 2007 for a resort project that never came to be. Today, nothing but its sand and incredibly small remains of the casino is all that is left of this place. However, the Neon Museum was able to keep multiple signs from the Silver Slipper before the demolition, including its iconic slipper signage. It remained in the Boneyard for a large number of years before finally being restored in 2009, in which today, it can still be seen near the iconic museum, rotating just like it did back in the olden days. For over 40 years, the Silver Slipper had become an icon of the vintage Las Vegas era, along with the early corporate era of Las Vegas with Howard Hughes Summer Corporation. Being the first major casino, this fabulous place was once able to stand alone as one of the most iconic and famous casinos in Las Vegas history.